The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a conversation between a woman and the librarian. Now you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen to the talk and answer the questions 1 to 6. Good morning. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I'd like to join the library. We're new to the district, you see. Hmm, certainly. Well, all we need is some sort of identification with your name and address on it. Oh dear. We just moved, you see, and everything has my old address. A uh, driving license, perhaps? No, I don't drive. No, your husband's would do. Yes, but his license will still have the old address on it. Hmm, perhaps you have a letter addressed to you at your new house. No, I'm afraid not. We've only been there a few days, you see, and no one's written to us yet. Oh, what about your bank book? That's just the same. Oh dear, and I did want to get some books out this weekend. We're going on holiday to relax after the move, you see, and I wanted to take something with me to read. Well, I'm sorry, but we can't possibly issue tickets without some form of identification. What about your passport? What? Oh, yes, how silly of me. I've just got a new one, and it does have our new address. I've just been to book our air ticket, so I have it on me. Ah, oh, well, that's all right. Your ticket will be ready soon. OK. Um, how many books am I allowed to take out? You can take four books out at a time. And you can also get two tickets to take out three magazines or periodicals. Newspapers, I'm afraid, can't be taken out. Oh, that's fine. Uh, do you have a record library? Some libraries do, I know. Yes, we do. You have to pay a deposit of $5 in case you damage them, but that entitles you to take out two records at a time. That's good. Could you show me where your history and biography sections are, please? Yes, just over there to your right. If there's any particular book you want, you can look it up in the catalogue, which you'll find just around the corner. You can also find a touchscreen information service on level two. Thank you. Oh, and how long am I allowed to keep the books for? Well, the normal loan period is three weeks, with two weeks extension. Oh, dear. We're going away for four weeks. Can I renew them now? I'm afraid not. You must do that at the end of three weeks. I see. Thank you very much. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen to the talk and answer the questions 7 to 10. Well, let's go into some details. Your name, please, madam. My name is Barbara. The surname is Cooper. It's spelt as C-O-O-P-E-R. Fine. And what's your contact number? If we have new books coming, we can contact you in time. Good. You can call me on 723-6518, but it's better after 5 p.m. You know I have to work during the daytime. Do you need the office number? I don't think so. It's enough. Could you tell me the address? I lived in King Road, but of course you need my new address. Um, it's 25 St. Mary Road, Hanwell. That's H-A-N-W-E-L-L. -L. Is that right? Yes. Do you need the passport number? I just brought it with me. Here you are. Yes, thank you. The number of your passport is G5798-0942. OK, and your ticket is ready. The number is M930123. Thank you. Could I take a look around and check out some books? Of course, as you like.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a conversation between an IELTS candidate and an IELTS administrator. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good afternoon. I'm applying for a master's programme at the University of Exeter in the UK. I'm planning to register for the IELTS exam at your centre next month. I have some questions I'd like to ask you before I register, if that's OK. Certainly. Would you be taking the academic module? I think so, but I'll have to contact the university just to make sure. You'll probably need the academic because most universities don't accept the general training. And anyway, the procedures to register for the exam are the same for both the general and the academic modules. Good. My first question is whether I sit all parts of the exam on the same day. I don't live here, you see. And for me, it would be more convenient to do all the papers on the same day. Hmm. Unfortunately, the speaking part is scheduled for Thursdays and reading, writing and listening tests take place on Saturdays. We can't change the days, I'm afraid. Hmm. That's a pity. Well, never mind. What sort of documents do I need to bring in order to register? You'll have to fill in the IELTS application form and bring an ID, a copy of your ID and two passport size photos on a white background. Will any ID do? We only accept original passports and national IDs. That's good to know. Did you say that reading, writing and listening are scheduled for Saturday? That's right. Will I get a break in between the papers? I'm afraid there aren't any breaks between the papers. Each paper takes an hour to complete, so it's three hours straight through. You'll first do listening and then reading, followed by the writing test. This is a standard requirement from Cambridge. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. OK, and how soon after the test can I pick up my results? It takes 13 calendar days for the results to be processed. Can you let me know how much it is and the form of payment? The examination fee is 200 US dollars. You can pay by credit or debit card. We also accept cheques. We only accept cash as a form of payment in exceptional circumstances. And one last question. Can I mail you the application documents? Certainly. You can send all the documents by registered mail to our address. 47 Clover Place, New Rochelle, New York. Could you spell New Rochelle for me, please? Certainly. N-E-W-R-O-L. 
C H E L L E. Could I have the zip code as well? Sure. Our zip code is one zero eight zero six. Thanks. You can also email us at i inquiry at examsmail dot com or phone us at three two five nine zero eight two. I think that's all. Thank you very much for all the information. Bye. You're welcome. Goodbye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. Listen to somebody giving a talk about how setting goals can help you achieve more. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see that so many people manage to make it—an achievement in itself. When I'm sure you're all so busy. This evening, I'm going to talk with you about setting goals and how setting goals can help you understand what you really want to achieve. First, though. I'd like to start by saying what I think achievement actually means. I think some people think it's simply about being successful in a job or making money, but it certainly doesn't have to mean that. Achievement is simply accomplishing goals that you set for yourself, doing what you plan to do, and people might plan to do all sorts of different things. Achievement. Is about realizing your dreams. I would also like to say that to achieve, you must have belief—belief belief that you can do whatever it is you want to do. There is more to achievement than simply wanting to do something. Anyone can say that they want something, but actually getting it is not so easy. To get it, you must believe that it is yours. Not having belief. Is the main reason that so many people do not achieve. If you really want something, you must talk and act like you already have it. Then you have belief, and then you will achieve. So, goal setting. Goal setting is about imagining the future and then turning the dream into a reality. Setting goals helps you to be clear about what you really want. And helps you concentrate on getting what you want. Setting goals will help you see what is stopping you from knowing what's important. And because achieving goals makes you feel good, you will be more confident and succeed more easily. Goal setting is something that all achievers do, whether they are high flyers in business or successful athletes. It is important that you set both long-term and short-term goals. First, you need to have an idea of what you want from life. I call this the big picture. Then you break this down into a number of smaller goals that you need to achieve in order to achieve the overall goal. As I say, the first step is to see the big picture. Think about what you want in the next fifteen or twenty years. Doing this will influence all the smaller goals that you set yourself. 
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. You need to think carefully about different areas of your life and how they influence each other. You should identify the important areas of your life and try to set goals in each of those areas. Here are the areas that most people want to focus on. But remember that everyone is different. First, Think about your career. How important is your career to you? Do you want to be a manager or run your own business? Or are you happy working for other people? Connected to this is the financial side of your life. What sort of income do you want to have? Is wealth important to you? You need to think about long-term relationships. At what age do you hope to be married? Do you want to have children? How much time do you want to spend with the people you love? You need to think about your health and how that could change what you can achieve. How will you stay healthy as you get older? Do you do anything that is not good for your health? And how will you try to do those things less or stop doing them completely? Finally, you need to think about your free time, your hobbies and interests. How much time do you want to have to do what you really enjoy? It is difficult to achieve goals in one area if you feel that you don't have the time to do the things that really make you happy. Now, when you have this overall picture, try to set yourself one goal for each area. Make sure the goals are what you really want and not what you think other people want from you. Of course, in life, it is important to make the people around you happy, but you must focus on what you want. Now, I will go on to talk about how to break your lifetime plan down into short-term goals. But first, does anyone have any questions about what I've said so far? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello and welcome. My name's Carolyn Tan. Just as there are a great number of different courses and places to study here, the teaching methods used and the skills you need will vary, depending on the subject you study and the college or university you attend. All courses vary, but most include some of the teaching methods I'm going to talk about today. Generally speaking, in some subjects, you will have timetabled classes for most of the week. In others, you may only have a few hours timetabled and will be expected to work independently for a substantial amount of time. 
Working independently is crucial at university. I'm going to go over the three main types of teaching method you will have here. These are lectures, seminars and tutorials. There are other methods that you will come across, like workshops, group work and practical work, but I'll describe the three main types for now. I'll briefly describe what they are and try to give you some helpful advice in dealing with them. Let's start by looking at lectures. These are large classes, usually lasting around one hour, where a lecturer or tutor talks about a subject and the students take notes. On some courses, there can be over a hundred students in a lecture. Unfortunately, there is usually little or no opportunity to ask questions during the lecture. Lectures are usually intended to do three things. Firstly, to guide you through the course by explaining the main points of a topic. Secondly, to introduce new topics for further study or debate. And thirdly, to give you the most up-to-date information that may not be included in textbooks. So as you can see, it's essential to go to lectures. Of course, you need to take notes in lectures. Remember, you don't need to write down everything the lecturer says. Try to concentrate on the main points and important details. Most lecturers use stories, examples and even jokes to illustrate a point. And you shouldn't write these down. When you take notes in lectures, abbreviations and symbols for common words and terms can help you write faster. If there is something you don't understand, make a note to ask after the lecture or in a tutorial. Most students try to write up their notes after a lecture. It's a good idea to try to be organised. Keep your notes from your lectures in order in a file, but don't just file the notes away until your exams. Read through them regularly, as this will help you with your revision. It's really important to go over your lectures. As an international student, the lecturer will recognise that you may need more help in lectures and that you may want to record the lecture on a digital recorder. If you do want to do this, ask the lecturer's permission first. They will usually agree. Finally, don't worry if you find it difficult to understand the lecturer at first. This will get easier as you get used to their style and as your English improves. OK, that's enough about lectures. Let's have a look at seminars now. Seminars are smaller classes where students and a tutor discuss a topic and they often last about the same time, if not longer than lectures. You will know in advance what the topic is and the tutor will usually ask some students to prepare a short presentation for discussion. Seminars are usually meant to encourage debate about an issue. This means different opinions will be expressed by the tutor and students. The aim is not for students to be told the correct answer, but to understand different arguments and make judgments about them. This process helps you learn to analyse topics critically. Some international students find that seminars can be a bit frightening, especially if they're not used to this kind of teaching. Don't worry, many other students feel the same at first. Participating actively in seminars is an important part of the learning process, so try to contribute, even if it seems difficult at first. It is best to do some reading before each seminar, so that you are familiar with the topic and can follow and contribute to the discussion. It may help you to make notes before the seminar of any points you would like to make. If you're having difficulty in seminars, discuss this with your tutor. And finally, I'll give you information on tutorials. Tutorials are meetings between a tutor and an individual student or small group of students. These usually last between 15 and 30 minutes. In a tutorial, the tutor will give you advice and guidance on a piece of work you are doing or a piece of work you have completed, or even a problem you may be having with a topic or with study methods. You should try to ask questions during tutorials about your work or about topics raised in lectures and seminars. Well, that's all for teaching methods. I'll go on now to talk about the different kinds of examinations. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.